Hello, and welcome to the Writers and Illustrators of the Future podcast. This is John Goodwin, your host. This podcast is dedicated to the aspiring writer or artist and will provide inspiration and tips from top professionals in the field, along with contest winners and a few surprise guests. Today we're at the World Science Fantasy Convention, and I'm here with our founding judge, Mr. Robert Silverberg. Thank you very much for um, meeting with us to go over this, because it's uh, we've got a lot of interviews that we've actually done, and when I found out that you were going to be here as a guest of honor at the World Fantasy Convention, I was... It took me about two seconds to write you to see if we could have this interview, so thank you very much. You've been a judge since the get-go. I think Algis was the first one that approached you on that. Yeah, this was, oh, back in the 1980s, somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, 83, I think it was. Somewhere back there, yes. And uh, the purpose of the contest was explained to me, and I said, this is a good thing. I Mm -hmm. was a young, struggling writer once, believe it or not. (laughs) And uh, people helped me along the way, opened doors for me, and I think it's appropriate to take part in this, and I did for about 30 years. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer a judge now, but there are a lot of... emeritus, as we had. Yeah, there, there are a lot of things I'm no longer. I'm <laughs> practically 85 years old, so uh, <laughs> I take my life easier. Yes. So... Um, I guess to, before we get into some of the other stuff about the, your philosophy of writing, um, have there been any particular highlights for you throughout your um, judging as a um, for the writers of the future of people you've either met or known or come to know or accomplishments? Well, of course, I never knew whose story I was reading as mm-hmm. a judge. They, they are completely right. anonymous. But I was quite pleasantly surprised to see some careers develop out of the contest, mm-hmm. big careers. Yeah, uh, and I got to meet some of the the winners. I remember David Zindel, one of your early winners, Karen Joy Fowler, mm-hmm. uh, Robert Reed, who was then called himself Robert Tuzelin. Right. I, I don't understand the reason for the pseudonym. Uh, and I've always enjoyed meeting the up and coming writers as. Someone who was once the youngest writer in the field and right. I outlasted that name, <laughs> uh, I was delighted to be part of the science fiction social group, to, to have my friends be science fiction writers. And, of course, I've outlived just about all of them now. I've, it's more than 60 years since I sold my first story. And so to meet the new guys mm-hmm. and see the good the good writers there. I, I, I'm not an envious character. I, I applaud their success. Right. To the degree that there's success, there's going to be more readers and more readers that can ultimately read your books as well as... Well, I hadn't thought of it that way quite exactly. I, I take a more abstract view. that <laughs> These are aspiring writers who are achieving something. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, if they bring in more readers and ultimately read me, I suppose I should applaud that. But yeah. uh, that's, that's not... Not been on my mind, it's not John. Been your viewpoint on it, yeah. Um, one special, um, I guess, aspect to you in your career is, you know, I t- kind of tend to view you as you're at the tail end of the golden age of science fiction that time period as a, as an author. Yeah. Um, and so you knew a lot of your contemporaries then, even though you were the the young pup at the time, the, the mascot of the, the team. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, as regards to John Campbell, Isaac Asimov, uh, Bob Heinlein, and Ron Hubbard, um, any particular stories or comments you've about those? Because they were recently addressed in a, in another book, which gave them all pretty much when it finally came out in an unfavorable light, which I thought was unfortunate. So I'm just curious for yourself, any um, of the... And this is a question that came from Jeff Berkowitz, who's a, an editor for... Um, uh, sci-fi magazine, and he's been going to Rise of the Future since probably the second year. And so he's he's followed all the different careers and stuff. So he said, can you please ask him, who's someone who's been active in the field for over half a century, what does he foresee, what does he have to say about um, these any of these people, your perspective? Well, I began my professional career in 1955. Mm-hmm. That's 64 years ago. <laughs> It's almost eligible for Medicare. <laughs> Alone. <laughs> and my career is, yes. And I, because I, I always go to the, the World Science Fiction Convention and occasionally to this fantasy convention, I got to know 
all the writers, with the curious exception of L. Ron Hubbard, who is the only major science fiction figure of that era that I never met. He had already launched Dianetics mm -hmm. and was no longer moving in the the science fiction social crowd that I got to know. Right. But I knew everybody else, and I got to know them very well. I was 21, and they were 40, but uh, they accepted me. Yes. And uh, what's what's been happening lately, uh, the, the attacks on people like Campbell, I think are very unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are attacks by people who, of course, didn't know Campbell. He's been dead since 1971. Right. And who are taking out of context a few extreme statements that he made. He was a provocateur. He enjoyed the Socratic process. He would throw out a startling statement, say, well, what do you think about that? And get a response, and it would on, go from there. These people... Uh, products of a different time, a different century, a different mm. culture, are, are misunderstanding the man. And, of course, uh, we are in a period of cultural change that makes uh, many of the, the heroes of the past into villains. I hesitate to get into these, these culture wars. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, too, I'm too old to fight. Uh, I think they're wrong. Right. Uh, the people who built science fiction, Heinlein, Asimov, Campbell, A. Van Vogt, uh, Ron Hubbard, uh, were men of their time. And I say men because except for Lee Brackett and C.L. Moore, uh, Judy Merrill, there were no women. It was it a was, um, field run, occupied by men, mm -hmm. uh, not because we excluded women, but they just didn't show up. Uh, it's not like football. Yes, there are no female football stars on the, the right. New York uh, Giants, yes. but there's a reason for that. Correct. Uh, women were always eligible to write science fiction, and some of them wrote great science fiction, but there weren't many. But anyway, the men who built science fiction were men of their times, uh, mostly uh, heterosexual, nearly all had military experience, uh, they enjoyed the the masculine uh, culture of their time, and it's wrong to to fault them for failing to live up to the norms of 2019. Mm -hmm. So we've had now some uh, distressing attacks, the renaming of awards. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Orwell got pretty right in his book, 1984. Yeah, the, the war is peace. Uh, yeah, uh, what are there? Are three of them. Uh, war is peace. Truth is. Well, anyway, Orwell, yeah, we're we're in Orwell's time. Exactly. You know, and just so the history gets rewritten. So it's you know you have that happening, and even how um, Bradbury talking to him, how he what sparked or ignited um, Fahrenheit four five one was. The, you know, the book burning, but even before that was like changing, you know, getting rid of words, you know, rewriting stories because it was inappropriate. Uh, and it was, um, that's what incited him to write Fahrenheit 451, seeing that trend going there. And you see it as well where certain books, because again, for that same basic reasoning, are inappropriate. Inappropriate. That's a very common modern word. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, when you approach the arts, uh, you should not be asking whether it's appropriate. Only, is this a successful work of art? Uh, Shakespeare, Othello, strangles his wife. Othello, bad thing. Well, of course, he regrets it and he stabs himself, but uh, still, one could say that Shakespeare is advocating abuse of women no he's not he's writing a play about a troubled man mm -hmm. and an innocent wife uh, a lot of other examples out of Shakespeare yeah. so far we still read him Dickens uh, all, all the great classics you will find a lot of politically incorrect things for sure yeah but at the time it was 
there, there was a concept of what's politically correct or incorrect wasn't relevant uh, relevant at all. No, no. Well, it's uh, troublesome to me only in the abstract because I'm now a retired writer. I don't have to uh, go into the marketplace and and try to determine what is appropriate. Right. But I think a lot of pre-censorship is being exercised now by frightened writers. And you, you see, you can lose your entire career through an outcry uh, that is not justified by the reality. And it's very hard to undo that. I, there was a couple, couple of cases of mainstream writers who were accused of this and that, and all of their books were taken off sale. And then they were rehabilitated because it turned out they hadn't done the this and that that they were accused of. But it was too late because their names are now forever blackened. Well, this is going to hurt the art of literature mm -hmm. and probably the other arts. Music, I guess, is safe. but uh, it's, well, It went through its curve as well. But it's interesting that you mention that because um, there have been a few of those... Um, Attacks as you you know against writers connected with the contest, writers of the future contest, and what's occurred as a result of that is that the contest has grown immensely because it's it's the contest isn't political, it doesn't have a bent or an agenda. Mm -hmm. It's strictly all about what Mr. Hubbard created in the first place for was to provide that launching pad for for aspiring writers, and so um, I, like I mentioned coming up here. Uh, we have two winners from the Illustrator Contest here, one from Turkey and one from Iran. Well, that's we're dealing with that with the State Department right now. But the arts aren't a political, um, I guess, fulcrum to use to drive. At least it shouldn't be. I know it has been. And um, But what this contest is about is the purity of science fiction, fantasy, alternate history, light horror, and to validate those writers. And we have people from around. We've got entries from over 175 countries now. So when this stuff happened, the entries just l literally rocketed. We never see how many it is, but it's you know we get thousands of entries a quarter now. I'm glad I'm not a judge anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it was because of of yourself that helped create that very solid bedrock that the contest has continued to grow and have that respectability because it is blind judging. Nobody has an idea at all of who's winning until. They've read the story and said, okay, oh, this is Bill or Mary or Jane from whatever country, whatever nationality, whatever religion, whatever creed, whatever color. That's, that's all secondary. Yeah, well, I had my career as a writer in a simpler era mm -hmm. where what mattered was telling a story that would draw the reader in and create in the reader a new world of imagination that would remain in the reader's mind forever. Mm -hmm. uh, that was our goal, and if we achieved it, well, then we went on to have nice careers. We were not concerned with playing back to the reader the reader's own beliefs and reflecting the norms of the moment. We were visioning the world of 20,000 AD or the world of the Galactic Federation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's been affected by the, the present harshness of uh, literary criticism in, in the political correct era, but I'm afraid See, it has. But we got this bubble called Rise of the Future where what you just said is the mentality we still maintain with that contest. If someone's got a, some type of an agenda, it doesn't make the cut, you know, because that's not what it's about. Yeah. One, one writer connected with the contest... Uh, belongs to a religious group that opposes same-sex marriage. And he has voiced, not in his stories as far as I know, but in his public statements, an opposition to same-sex marriage. And this has drawn a lot of uh, harsh attacks on him, but his books still sell in the millions. Mm -hmm. Somebody is reading him, so he is giving pleasure to a great many readers who are not concerned with what he privately believes. It's been the best-selling book for Tor. Yeah. I, when I spoke with Tom Doherty, he said that's that's that his namesake book is the best-selling book for Tor. Yeah. So you're right. You know. So um, 
Anyway, in fact, when he's down here, I'm going back to see him. He's at my office right now. <laughs> so um, any other particular anecdotes you've got about either uh, Campbell, Asimov, Heinlein, not with Hubbard because you didn't meet him, but any of those? Well, Heinlein, uh, Heinlein was uh, very active in the uh, fallout shelter movement at a time when uh, when uh, we expected nuclear warfare at right. any moment. And when, in 1961, a I, I, young, prosperous writer bought a house in New York, uh, Bob, as we called him then, though later he became Robert, Yes. Uh, Bob said to me, of course you're going to put in a fallout shelter. And I said, no. No, it, it's in New York, and that's the first place they'll attack. I don't want to survive an atomic war. I don't want to come out into that radioactive war. I would just as soon have them drop the bomb right on top of my house, if they're going to drop it at all. And though he had only the warmest feelings for me, he was really angry. Mm -hmm. He was furious that I was not willing to be a survivor. And we, we patched it up, of course, but <laughs> uh, I was startled by that. Uh, you yeah, know, he definitely, um, John Campbell definitely, from at least everything I've read about him in the various notes and letters back and forth between Hubbard and him, he, was, he definitely was very strong-minded. Strong-minded is the right word for yeah. Campbell, yeah. yes. He was a big man physically mm -hmm. and very imposing. And uh, when you went to see him, and he liked having writers come in to see him, every Tuesday and Friday he had open house in his office. And anyone who was in the New York area would go regularly. I was there all the time yeah. from the time I was a very young writer on. And it was the Socratic method. Immediately he... He would, you would walk in and say, hello, John, and you'd say hello to, to Kay, Kay Tarrant, who was his assistant editor and was sitting next to him. And he would, without saying, hello, Bob, he would say, Peg and I were talking last night, Peg being Mrs. Campbell. Peg and I were talking about, and he would string Lots. out some abstract concept. And how do you feel about that? I mean, you, you haven't even taken your coat off yet. And there, <laughs> there, there you are. Well, so you got into a dialogue with him. Uh, what he didn't want was his own ideas played back to him. He he, he right. wanted uh, dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. I, he once suggested a story idea to me. I was 22 or 23. And I went home and I wrote that story. And he said, well, all you did was write my story. I want you to write your story. And he rejected it. He was a great editor. Yeah. Uh, shook up the field, changed everything. And just about everybody who was anybody uh, revered him. Mm -hmm. uh, curiously, he was a little afraid of Hubbard. Uh, Hubbard was a very successful pulp writer when John, who was only 27 or so, became the editor of Astounding, as mm -hmm. it was called. And uh, Campbell's boss said, we want some jazzier storytelling in this magazine. Get Hubbard to write for you. He's not a science fiction writer, but he knows how to tell a story, and he can figure out what science fiction is. So they were starting from a position where Hubbard was really the dominant figure, and Campbell wasn't used to that. <laughs> but they worked it out, yeah. and uh, Hubbard did a lot of material for John. Before, this was before World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when Hubbard came back from the war, he wrote a little more, wrote a couple of novels for Campbell, but then came Dianetics, right. out of which came Scientology and that was different, different life. Yeah. Asimov, um, well, he and I have followed parallel paths 15 years apart. Uh, smart Jewish boys from Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, who at the age of 21 fell into the Campbell orbit. Uh, Isaac was born in 1920. I was born in 1935. So we had different right. different uh, chronology, but the same trajectory. And uh, I remember a uh, book of Campbell's letter that was published, and there was a letter there. John said, uh, Bob, Bob Silverberg brought me a story today. He's a very bright boy. I think he might do for me what Isaac did. Wow. Yeah, I thought... 
That's... And then, of course, as I grew up, Isaac and I became close friends and ultimately collaborated on, on, on some books. But uh, to me, at the beginning, Isaac was a godlike figure. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, he just was Isaac, my friend. Yeah. Uh, one of the brightest people I've ever encountered. Uh, so quick-minded. Uh, you would throw a, uh, a word at him, and he would immediately improvise a limerick that wow. would, would scan. I mean, anybody could do a clumsy off kilter limerick, but Isaac would do diddly 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 right, just pop right out of him. The uh, the whole Campbell crowd, they were significant personalities, and uh, there are not very many left who actually dealt with John, and so he, he's a fair game to be attacked by people to whom he's just an unknown historical figure. Yeah, it's unfortunate some people, they're the way that they can try to claim some notoriety is by attacking somebody that has notoriety. Well, the woman who attacked him at last year's convention certainly got notoriety for it. Right. But not, not for me in a good way. No. So uh, did you ever um, work with Bob Heinlein? I didn't work with him. Nobody worked with right, well, Heinlein. He didn't, he didn't collaborate. Uh, no, but we, we were friends. Uh, and... Uh, I once, I once ran a story of his in an anthology that I was editing, and the final three pages of the story were left out of the published book. <laughs> I didn't know it. I wasn't doing my own proofreading. And this is a story called The Year of the Jackpot, and you really want to know what the jackpot was. <laughs> and he called. I lived, I do live in, in the San Francisco area. He lived down the road in Santa Cruz. He called. I said, I got your new book, and it's got my story in it. It's got most of my story in it. <laughs> and he was really very gentle about that. I, I said, you know, I would not have countenanced this. It's not my plan to drop Heinlein and punchlines out of stories. Another writer might have taken me to court, I don't know, but he, he was very yeah. sweet about it. Uh, I remember very early on, uh, when we met, uh, I was 25, I think, when I met him. He said, you've, you've published a lot of stuff, haven't you? And I was a very prolific writer. He was not. He, he was a slow mm -hmm. worker. I said, yeah, I have uh, four or five million words of fiction, I think. And he said, you've used some of them more than once, haven't you? <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, I mean, you're right, it's a different time period. It's a different... Thing here, but the, what we try to do and why we really respect you as a judge for you know how we got started is, is from that I don't call it simplicity, but the purest aspect of science fiction and fantasy, and from that golden age too, which <clears throat> I know at least uh, Hubbard and Heinlein shared was that um, science fiction became a, a goal to help take man's attention off of warring with each other and going into space and the space race to create that and to um, put attention out in the future, what's the future going to hold? And it wasn't necessarily a whole black hole. It was, you know, there was a future that, you know, people could aspire to. At least that was one thing from both of them that I got. Well, science fiction does a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, story of Heinlein's, a wonderful story called By His Bootstraps, a time travel story mm -hmm. in which all the characters are basically the same man, caught in paradox. That doesn't tell us anything about how best to live or what the future will be like. It just tells us, here's a great story, and it'll drag you by your, your fingertips right through it. That's all. On the other hand, a story like uh, Hubbard's novel Final Blackout from 1940, uh, just as World War, I, World War II was about to happen, was a very grim portrait of what an unending war is going to be like. Now, we didn't think in terms of unending wars then. Now we're living through a number of them. Mm -hmm. So these are both science fiction stories with very different purposes and very different effects, but it all subsumes under the title of science fiction. Right, right. So on, um, have you, um, one of the questions I got from Jeff Berkowitz is, um, 
As someone who's been active in the field for over half a century, what do you foresee as the future of science fiction, not fantasy literature, um, especially since so many science fiction ideas increasingly become reality and so much pop culture seems to be veering towards fantasy, horror, and superheroes as opposed to, honest to goodness, speculative fiction? Well, that science fiction ideas becoming reality, that's an old story. That, that's, mm-hmm. that's like the fellow at the patent office back in 1845 who said, we might as well close up, everything's been invented. Right. Uh, we've watched science fiction become reality ever since there was science fiction, and that's not a process that's going to stop because reality keeps extending itself. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I would not has a hurry to to explain my feelings about the future of science fiction because I'm no longer an active player or even an active observer. I, in my remaining years, a lot of other things I want to read besides more science fiction. <laughs> uh, so I don't know where it's going, but I imagine it'll stay pretty much the same. Uh, the published science fiction, uh, it's been diluted of late by what I regard as amateur writing now, this is a science fiction experience now that we have self-publishing available at the flick of a computer, Mm -hmm. everybody is publishing. Right. And I had to go through a very arduous, fiery apprenticeship, as did Heinlein and Asimov and Camp and all the rest. You don't have to do that now. All you need is a computer and a printer, and you can... I see out in in this convention tables full of books that people have published of their own. Well, when there's no arbiter saying this is not good, uh, you have uh, the freedom to be not good. Yes. And that's a freedom, that a privilege that we never had. So I think the it'll be difficult in the future to find the real stuff among the flood of... Uh, self-published, self-promoted things, not my problem. (laughs) But that is one thing that quite possibly plays the advantage of um, the contest because there are so few um, vehicles to to winnow out the really good, you know, potential writers that if they really stick to it, they can have themselves a career. Well, the people doing the winnowing at the moment are themselves... The toughened professionals. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope that as people like me drop out of the contest, they are not replaced by uh, people I wouldn't regard as professional. Once you've had the turnover, that defines everything downward because the new norm is lower. Mm-hmm. You'll suffer too, but that may take ten or twenty years to work itself through. Fortunately, because we're very keen on that to make sure that the judges that are reviewing this stuff are the seasoned pros, the ones that, um, I don't think we've got any, we don't have anybody that came the new line. You know, there's mm-hmm. still plenty, and there's, there's still plenty of, of mainstream publishing in the years to come <clears throat> yeah. that we're going to continue to work with as, as our source of judge. In fact, tomorrow I'll be talking to uh, Tom Doherty, um, publisher for Tor, you know, and um, he's, you know, that whole thing of like the mainstream and like really getting the mainstream guys who are like yourselves worked up through the ranks and proved yourself and know the importance of a good editor, know the importance of, of really doing it right and not by the luck of the, the draw or because you have some good friends and somebody says in a good social post, here we go. It, it's a whole thing has to happen. Yeah. Well, Tom Doherty is a good man to talk to. He's my age. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a central figure in the field is mm-hmm. dominant publisher with a lot of good writers and a lot of good editors. Yeah. And I think the future of science fiction is in great measure dependent on what Tom and his uh, associates do. Yeah, he, he received uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award himself because of what he's done for the contest, yeah. the award that you received um, in Beverly Hills several years ago. He more, received- than, more than several. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, uh, yeah, he received that, and but he's out here this this weekend as well. Yeah, so something gonna, last night. Yeah, so we're going to chat about um, the contest because he was there also in Las, when the Rise of Future was in Las Vegas more than several years ago, 
And um, then again, a few years ago, he was there. So it's good. And it turns out he published virtually all of the judges at one yeah. time or another. Yeah. So he definitely knew everybody. So um, any particular, I guess, is the senior coach. <laughs> <laughs> any particular, um, like you said, you said you've kind of like you're, you're done. You, you're moving on now. You know, you're Rise of Future Judge Emeritus. But any particular things, because what's come up on surveys is that uh, what people get the most out of Writers of the Future, one, if they get published, then that pretty much takes some of the slush pile with whatever they submit. And even now, because there's so many submissions, if a person's an honorable mention, they're finding that their stories will sell pretty fast. But um, it's that that encouragement, don't give up, don't quit, you know, keep on persisting. Anything along those lines that you would that you could say? Well, I can say that I hear all the time, I want to be a writer. Those people will never be writers. The ones who want to be writers are going to stay wannabes. The ones who are going to be writers will be writing. And you continue, and you continue, and you continue. And either the universe will tell you, you don't have it, <laughs> and you'll be realist enough to give, give up. Uh, as John Campbell used to say, the opinion of the universe is always right. There's your opinion, there's his opinion, there's their opinion, and then there's the opinion of the universe, and that's the right one. Uh, those who persevere, I mean, I'm a bad one to talk because I launched my career when I was in my teens and went straight on from there. I was very lucky. It was an easier time. Uh, I had very little competition, and dare I say it, I was good. Well, you're and definitely good, but there was also the time period also didn't allow for a whole... You had to be good in order to make it. Well, you had to be good, but I was, and I didn't have 5,000 other people competing with me. I had, of course, people like A.J. Budras and uh, Sturgeon and Jack Vance and Fritz Leiber and a lot of other people taking up space in the magazines. <laughs> but I was able to find a way between there. But all I can say is if you are going to be a writer, not just want to be, but going to be a writer, you will write... And if you have what it takes, you will find that out very quickly, and somebody will confirm that for you. As and it, it, I remember when I saw the first uh, David Zindel, uh manuscript, uh, or Gardner Des Oise, I was one of the first to publish a Gardner Des Oise story, or uh, Wolver Dave Wolverton. Mm -hmm. You only had to read a paragraph or two and to know this guy knows how to do it. He holds your attention. Well, if you have that, you will be a writer. If you don't have it, you will never be able to do it. Right. So you'll find out. Right. As uh, for your own writing career, have you, um, with respect to science fiction, has it been pretty much um, a straight line that you've tried to follow, or have you gone at all with, with trying different aspects of science fiction? Because we're just talking about the science fiction part of your writing career? Well, I've tried every aspect of science fiction. I've written wild space opera. I've written serious, introspective, philosophical books. I wrote whatever seemed to be the next book to write and followed whatever path uh, I found myself following. Mm -hmm. uh, it all worked. Yeah. Uh, there were times when science fiction became commercially uh, difficult and I am one of the rare writers who has never held an outside job. I've supported myself as a freelance writer ever since college. Uh, when science fiction became commercially unrewarding and there was the rent to pay, I wrote something else. I wrote books of archaeological history. I wrote biographies. I wrote Western stories occasionally, <laughs> not not very often. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did what professional writers do. But with, within science fiction, I, I wrote all kinds of science fiction. I right. played, played with it. Oh, good. And then I've seen you over the years at conventions. So has that been a major role for you in terms of establishing and maintaining a fan base? Well, I don't worry much about a fan base uh, per se. That, that will look after itself. For me, the convention is a family reunion. Uh, I'm an only child. By choice, I had no children. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, I've outlived my older relatives by now. 
So when I come to the convention, I'm seeing friends of 30, 40, 50 years who are essentially members of my family. And you can't replace that in the outside yes, world. That's for sure. Uh, and also going to the convention uh, has tremendous professional advantages. I hang out with the editors. I, uh, people come up to me who are editing anthologies and say, I'm, I'm doing an anthology of uh, stories about people with seven arms. Do you happen to have, have written any? I said, well, yes, uh, back there in 1983. So there's, there's plenty of business to be done. Uh, as for establishing a fan base, no, that's not been on my mind. I mm. am happy to meet fans and shake their hands and sign their books, and I'm nice to them. I'm, mm. I'm nice to everybody. It costs no more. That's right. And they remember. Yeah, they do and remember. they tell their friends. They do remember, yes. 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 People come up to me and say, I met you at the 1987 convention, and you said some wonderful thing to me. I said, oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, you're right. It's just as easy to be nice and have that lasting memory, which is which is a good thing. And that's, Actually, that's it's, family. it's much easier to be nice. Mm -hmm. uh, my dear friend Harlan Ellison made a specialty of not being nice, and that entangled him in all manner of furious, sweaty debates, angry shouting. Uh, I don't think that makes sense. Yeah. Because for him it was uh, exercise. That's, that was like going to the, the health club. He would get into a fight. Yeah, he was, he was funny. He would just, I mean, realize this is a digression, but he would be, he'd have his various statements and his incendiary comments, and then he'd call me, I need your help on copyright protection. <laughs> <laughs> Say Harlan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's quite typical. Yeah. So um, in terms of any then last um, words as, of, um, I don't say of advice, that's pretty trite, but anything... In terms of the people who will be listening to this podcast are aspiring writers, but also writers who are published that want to take it to the next level um, with their career and looking for any direction or thoughts. I mean, you've already made the one thing, a writer writes. You don't... <clears throat> a writer also reads. I think it's very important to read the best other fiction and see how it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, on occasion, I have read a novel and immediately at last page, turn back to page one. I want to see how he did that. I remember the John le Carré came, comes to mind, the little drummer boy, little drummer girl. Uh, when I finished the novel, I thought, wow, how did he do that? And I'm an old pro, and I was startled by that. So I read it again, this time knowing what was going to happen to see. So, of course, do a lot of writing, but also read, absorb, criticize, in your head, try to determine how these effects were achieved. Hell, even Picasso looked at Velázquez. How did he do it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's one thing that uh, many of the judges have said. You know, just read the Rise of Future books. Just they've made the cut. You know, at that level, and they've not, they've gone from being amateur to at this at this level being professionally published with Rise of the Future or the anthology in terms of short fiction. How do they do it? How do you introduce a character? How do you transition to short fiction? You have a lot less time to do anything with than a novel. Oh, yes. In a novel, you can have a whole three chapters that don't belong there and nobody will care. Yeah. Short story, two lines out of place, and you've ruined the whole thing. Yeah. Have you found either one um, more to your liking to, to write? Yeah, when, I'm, when I was, I should use the past tense. Yes. When I was writing a novel... I would think somewhere around the second month, gee, I wish I were writing a short story now. <laughs> and when I was writing a short story, tensely aware that you can't make a single mistake, every every line has to be exactly where it belongs. I would think if I were writing a novel now, I could just lean back and do a chapter for the fun of it. And mm -hmm. So yes, I, whenever whichever one I was doing, I preferred the other one. But I was glad to be able to do both. Yeah. I, I did have uh, careers in both short and long fiction, and it was uh, very satisfactory. I had a very satisfactory career. I, you absolutely have. And I I'm lived, lived my own adolescent fantasies the whole way, and that's not common. That's very not common. Well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to, to talk, and I know there's a lot of people who will be very interested to, to uh, hang on to every last syllable. Well, cast the pod wildly. <laughs> and thank you for listening. 
Subscribe to the Writers of the Future podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Writers and Illustrators of the Future are contests created by Owen Hubbard to provide a means for the aspiring writer and artist to be seen and acknowledged. It is free to enter and open to new and amateur short story writers and artists of science fiction or fantasy. And thank you, Bob, for this interview. Well, thank you, John. It's been good talking to you.